I think we're starting soon. Evening all. Hope the stream is okay. Um, okay, so uh, this week I'd like to look at Nigel Short at the Gibraltar tournament, uh, 2013 Gibraltar tournament. Uh, so I've got a selection of his games. Uh, so he's one of the, the strongest uh, players uh, playing in Gibraltar, just outside the 2700 club at the moment, 2690. But he has been over 2700 in the past. And his style of play is very, very interesting. So yeah, I thought I'd look at a few games of his in uh, Gibraltar. So in in round one, he was uh, playing a twenty two hundred player, and it's interesting to look. I think at these, um, you know, what what happens when you know a very strong grandmaster plays, uh, you know, a, a typical you know, feeder eight player twenty two hundred, not to be scoffed at, but uh, not not super grandmaster or anything. So he was playing white. And he played uh, d4, and often in the past he was an e4 player, so he's experimenting, I think, with uh, well, he's widening his opening repertoire, and so is Michael Adams, it seems, as well. They're both widening their opening repertoire. So I just wonder, you know, this emphasis uh, that we've had about opening theory, uh, I think, has passed now. I think a lot of grandmasters are playing all sorts of things just to avoid preparation. I think it's quite a practical thing to do in the modern climate of um, preparation and engines and okay so his opponent played d5 uh, so Sanchez Castillo 2212 plays d5 and we get now Slav defense okay and we see Knight f3 Knight f6 Knight c3 black plays e6 not tempted to win a pawn or anything and now we see sort of Catalan move g3. Black's still not tempted to try and win the c4 pawn. It might actually be possible at some point here, but Black keeps very ultra solid knight bd7. So this ultra solid triangle, Slav tri triangle, bishop g2, bishop d6, both sides castle, and then we get uh, knight d2 knight f d2 protecting c4 and this also makes way now for e4 potentially and actually after h6 we see e4 so white's getting uh, a threat now of e5 which needs to be dealt with and black takes here actually um, which seems to give white an, quite a nice position Gaining a tempo on that bishop. Bishop goes back. Okay, rook e1. And now black takes on e4, trying to get rid of uh, a couple of knights. And this this move f uh, this move f5 is now played, which potentially weakens e6. Uh, but is it clear how this can be punished? Uh, so how is this going to be punished? Well, white plays now knight c3, and already e6 is under fire. And there's potential for d5 at some point as well. But Black's idea is to play very aggressively against Nigel Short. Black plays f4. Okay, so can this pawn actually be taken? Uh, probably it's a bad idea here. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, threats that could happen if that rook takes. Um, one such being, for example, knight c5 might be useful. Um, let's have a quick look. Rook takes e6. What could black play here? Or maybe first taking on g3 might be an idea. Uh, but anyway, Nigel avoids all this. He doesn't need maybe this this kind of um, danger. So this um, this move f4. He just plays actually a more solid move. He just plays b3 b3 okay what does b3 do maybe there's sometimes bishop a phrase to look at that rook from there on the across that diagonal okay black continues now with e5 and we just get this bishop a3 so 
black's under a little bit of pressure here and now um, actually there's there's a problem uh, for black's position already here uh, which is exposed black actually plays e takes d4 and white now can win material by force in this position uh, believe it or not even, even though initially it might look a little bit um, dangerous this f file and bishop b6 is if say queen d6 white actually plays a forcing move bishop e7 uh, for those of you who just come, I mean, this is a Nigel Short game from Gibraltar against Sare Sanchez Castillo. It was in round one of the of the Trade Wise Gibraltar tournament. So Bishop e7 is actually forcibly winning the exchange here. Uh, so Black's trying to play aggressively, but uh, is forcibly losing the exchange. Bishop takes f8 is again kicking the queen. Okay, so queen takes f8, and now queen takes d4. Uh, is there a problem here after fg hg you might think well bishop b6 the queen surely can just protect f2 with say queen d2 that should be okay so uh, black has lost the exchange knight f6 and we see knight e4 here knight g4 Rook AD1 just continuing to centralize pieces now. Queen F5. C5 extinguishes this diagonal as a potential threat. If it was going to be useful for black, it's not anymore. And also it gives a hook for the knight to go to D6. So black hasn't got any attack now. It's just the exchange down. Of the bishop E6, knight D6. It's a wipeout. Black actually doesn't like the position anymore and uh, resigns here it uh, it looks pretty bad uh, the exchange arm for not much uh, so black actually resigned here so it seemed quite an effortless game 23 moves in that first round um, but uh, you know there, there was a kind of gambit which was sidestepped here by black this this gambit that black was playing for this very aggressive move f5 followed by f4 was simply sidestepped uh, completely by this move b3 so that's quite interesting okay so and white actually just won the exchange okay let's let's go on to um, another game ah um, if you press play, there's a problem with someone on. Okay, press play. Uh, okay. So I'm going to go and load this second game now in round two. So actually, Nigel Short was playing black here. Uh, Okay, so um, uh, e4 was played by Ismail Teran Alvarez 2399 in round two, so a lot higher than the first round opponent. And Nigel plays um, the French defense. Uh, he plays e6, so after d4, d5, knight c3, we see the classical. Knight f6, an invitation to close the center, which white accepts. There's also bishop g5, some other moves, but bishop g5 is the main other alternative. Um, so, okay, so knight fd7, and white uh, plays f4, so it's standard kind of uh, center attack it's all fairy so far um, now a slightly unusual uh, position uh, well a move a slightly unusual move I think is is about to occur in this French defense uh, position black plays actually now 
uh, queen b6. I think common, more common might be knight c6 here, but queen b6 was played. So without any knight c6, what, what is actually going on here without knight c6? Uh, we see bishop e3, and uh, I think it might be quite dangerous to take on b2 here. Uh, so for example knight I think knight b5 would be quite dangerous or just knight uh, a4 perhaps knight a4 even is quite, is quite dangerous here or knight b5 is looking at c7 as well so that pawn was avoided anyway uh, we saw instead here the move a6 okay so what does a6 do potentially black's going to play for b5 and gain space on that queen side um, now a3 and quite a provocative idea is played here trying to keep this queen on this potentially sensitive diagonal because you can imagine uh, later black might be interested in uh, putting pressure on d4 and e5 and, and say sacrificing on e5 layer so this queen might be useful on this diagonal but this move looks quite unusual queen a7 queen tucks away on a7 i would say that looks a little bit on the eccentric side but quite if if, if black can win from such a position this would be quite um uh nifty so um okay uh so with the pressure uh, maintained on d4 uh, white reinforces actually the d4 um, pawn with knight e2 is, is preparing say c3 now the question here is is white getting a kind of free hand on on the king side because potentially white has this strategic break uh, with f5 coming up so uh, okay so we see knight c6 and white reinforces the center and now um, this next move d does look a bit provocative c4 because it's closing uh, the position it's, it's releasing that central tension white has got a very good uh, central control here grip and it's almost like a, a free hand on the king side which white makes use of now white plays uh, g4 okay so it's it's difficult to kind of for black uh, to counteract this that easily the, the the nearest available break pawn break would be like this for b4 wouldn't it so I wonder how many of you think uh, would what do you think about this position so far do you think it heavily favors white or black or is about equal what do you think if I give you 20 seconds starting from now uh, what do you think Be cool, someone said on the stream. <coughs> oh, me. Uh, <clears throat> White bit of advantage. Gagger 12 over 4. Okay. Um, I like White Krisky. Okay, Pat MC White has a slight edge. Um, is, is everyone on stream? Um, okay not many uh, people on stream have said anything it's more on the play chess server tonight okay so just wondering any thoughts there white better okay let, let's, let's proceed okay it's, it's fine with me okay white yeah I think white is is better I think this this is looking quite dangerous here this f5 strategic break what will happen when f5 arrives on the scene here I mean, for example, e6 will be under fire. The f file generally could be a useful resource 
for white. But not only that, it's not just the option of taking it, it's the option of f6, which might need to be factored in. But let's see, so we see b5, knight g3, knight b6, bishop g2, very close position, knight a4. Okay, something is actually finally attacked, queen c2, protecting b2. Bishop d7, as though the black king might be interested in castling queenside. White castles kingside. And uh, well, the problem is here, for example, that f7 might be a target. If, if casting queenside, knight g5, forcing move, could embarrass f7. I guess you could think the bishop could go back. But uh, Nigel spends another move maybe to prevent knight g5. He doesn't routinely castle. Um, and um, okay, we see rook a e1, and this this piece is no longer loose. So the, these kind of tactical ideas on e5 are, are really ruled out uh, for the foreseeable future. That this queen is it doing much? Now black castles queenside, and we see f5. So what are the benefits of f5? So king b8. If the king's over here, it's not to get a, an onslaught on the king. But white plays rook f2 anyway, as if the f file is really is a key operation. This f file, white's an international master, by the way, Ismail Terran Alvarez, and I am. So bishop c8. And now we start to see pressure on g7 with knight h5. So this poor g7 pawn is, um, is, is under fire a little bit. Okay. Queen d7. <clears throat> is black really going to win too? I doubt it. Anyway, but knight h4 protects f5 totally. Rook g8. Is black really going to do something on this g file? There's so many resources here. Does black have any right to play on, the, on this side of the board? Rook e f1. As though this f file is still of interest. Queen e8. Looks a bit passive. h3. And now black does do something on this side of the board. E takes f5. And we see knight takes f5, which seemingly uh, offers, say, uh, this possibility. It looks as though there's a possibility, at least, of, of g6, but maybe just knight f6 there. And you see that attacks the queen. So g6 is not really on the cards here. So there's a lot of pressure on g7 being built up. Black plays f6. And we see e takes f6. Bishop takes f5. Check. Bishop d6. That's taken. Check. So white's actually won a pawn here. Did black have to lose a pawn out of that? We just saw black playing f6 and losing a pawn. Let's just rewind just slightly here. Hold on a sec. Why did black have to play f6? What was white threatening here? Does anyone have an idea what white would be threatening in this position? If I give you 20 seconds starting from now. f6 was played. Why? Can we gain empathy here? Any ideas? In order to set out Queen G6, that's, I suppose that's one idea, but uh, it's on the side of the board where black should be really, really worse. There's so many resources around here. Um, possibly, you know, white might be threatening. Uh, well, knight d6 looks nasty uh, because this dark square bishop could be lethal on this, on this, on here. So f7 will be really under fire here if knight d6 as well, just winning f7. So maybe maybe that's a principal threat, knight d6 or knight g3 as you say, just just attacking f7 as well. 
It looks difficult to defend, but knight d6 looks nasty, even if that pawn's one, there's bishop f4s after that. So, okay, so black ended up losing a pawn here with f6. Ah, and now we see this reason that uh, maybe he was banking on this, this fork here, but a queen f4, no, fork doesn't do anything, attacking the rook. Whoops, that's protected, and we see white's clearly a pawn up now. So rook f8, and now knight g7 threatens actually knight e6 here, because this bishop's ob this rook's obviously pinned, so knight e6, this pawn is a solid pawn, surely. We see g5, queen g3, keeping that pin, keeping the threat of knight e6. Okay, whoops. And, um, so actually king a7, and then we see rook e1, and now there's a threat of rook e8. And Nigel, believe it or not, he had to resign. He's been taken down in this game in round two. A bit of a shock in Gibraltar. He was beaten by a 2-3-9-9, an IM, but only 2-3-9-9, he's 26-90. So it was a bit of a shock in round two that this occurred, this loss. But uh, Black really was rolled over on the king side. So that's kind of instructive because it's, it shows the dangers of, of closing uh, the position. If we if we rewind this game, how Black really didn't get any... Um, the pressure was released from the centre, which gave White this classical free hand to play for f5. And White really made the maximum use of this, uh, stretching out for f5, building up on g7. It just started to look incredibly nasty, this f file. This strategic break with f5 is really quite effective. Uh, and that pawn is just, just winning. The knight slips into the position. And it was a bit of a shock, a bit of a round two shock. From the pairing side of things, that means slightly easier draw after that, not, not always playing GMs in every single round. So let's see what happened after. So what happened in round three? Okay, so in round three, uh, Nigel was playing another 2200. Back to play a 2200, but it's, I think it's quite instructive to see how to play against 2200s. So, he played actually c4, okay, and knight f3, and we get another kind of dullish kind of system as black. Black again playing this Slav defense, very popular uh, for black to do this as a kind of start position, stable start position. But hang on, what was this h3 about here? Black uh, maybe is facing now with g4 is this at all dangerous this concept or g4 at some point black just castled here and we saw queen c2 so what is this about this position looks like quite an attacking position against the slav uh why hasn't committed this d pawn here uh so what does this actually mean this position this bishop hasn't moved yet either we see a6 and now an aggressive move g4 is played so is this knight sympathy going to be dislodged from defending h7 here <clears throat> can black do something in the center he plays knight c5 putting a greater eye on e4 here but uh, this control of e4 is putting question with g5 does this this knight really want to go to, to e4 is that really desirable here black fought better of it um and i mean there could be some issues uh, for example, let's have a look. Knight e4, knight takes e4. Uh, and already, you know, the bishop's eyeing g7 here. So let's go with knight takes e4, bishop d3 looks good. And if d takes e4, then uh, it looks pretty, pretty dangerous, uh, this position with this, this bishop on this diagonal. Uh, possibly 
even queen c3 might be a good good start here uh, to threaten mate uh, among other things so whatever the reason black actually retreated the knight to e8 uh, here okay so knight e8 and now Nigel finally played d4 so we see uh, knight d7 h4 very aggressive will, will there be line opening will it be with g6 and h5 or will, it, will there be something else we see b5 from black bishop d3 really just questioning this h7 pawn how is it going to be defended if it's defended with g6 then just simply h5 and we're li opening up lines things very much it looks as though black the black king has had it here so black tries f5 which opens up the g file if white does it on person the g file could be dangerous now and that is the case g takes f6 knight d takes f6 so we've got a dangerous looking g file white can potentially castle queen side white closes up the queen side first with c5 if his king's going to live over here maybe he doesn't want this b file potentially open with bc so the bishop goes back and then we see knight e5 and if white's given another move this this is a great knight you know maybe f4 after and where is black's counterplay after that and it's also hitting of course c6 is black really gonna do a defensive move to defend c6 here black actually took this maybe surprisingly and is sacrificing now the h7 pawn which is taken king h8 so there's a problem here isn't black double attacking e5 and f2 well this double attack is parried with knight d1 that's sufficient the knight protects f2 and the bishop protects e5 okay so white's just munched an important kingside defensive pawn we see b4 it looks it looks pretty bad for black now uh, because also you know f6 is is out of black's uh, control with this pawn here a5 f4 closing up that f file also giving the queen useful squares like um, g2 to come to or maybe e2 to get to h5 soon we see knight c7 and queen e2 the knight goes back and now this this knight on d1 is quite attacking as well knight f2 so is knight g4 going to be a menace bishop d7 knight g4 if the knight ever moves uh, then maybe just well it's, it would be attacking there maybe potentially just taking because you don't want this diagonal open up with e6 but black didn't move that knight uh, he actually just played bishop e8 h5 a4 there isn't too much counterplay on the queen side to be concerned about okay so we see knight takes h6 g takes and this diagonal is really interesting to try and open up this next move uh, shows that idea f5 if if takes this is going to be quite nasty this this check so um black played a takes b3 and for the sake of getting some extra time for the attack this this was actually ignored not, not bother recapturing here i'll just place f6 so he's closing up the queen from that g5 square and this h6 is a target potentially to moves like this to attack h6 now okay we see rook takes a2 rook takes a2 b takes a2 queen g4 that's, that's a way to attack h6 as well I'll just go like this as well as threatening things on g7 soon if the bishop moves um okay 
So queen a8, threatening uh, to queen. That simply parried with king f2. So white's defending that a1 square now. Multiple threats. Uh, the immediate ones actually, may, well, bishop takes, knight takes, defends g7. But uh, there's another threat, of course. After rook g8, we see another threat. As mentioned before, just queen f4. How can black defend h6 here? End of game. I know I only have 2200 opponent, but it's kind of interesting how that attack evolved uh, from a solid opening choice from black. Let's have a quick look at that again. So look at this. So c4, this is interesting. So that dreaded Slav defense, it's a way of playing against it. White played e3, betraying an idea that actually it's it's this diagonal, it's this bishop that's going to be fanchettoed. Uh, it's going to be about dark square control early on. Uh, so knight c3, there's no there's no problem about d4s here. Uh, black isn't even going for e5 anyway. So this bishop is going to help contest the dark squares. Uh, so it's a novel approach, and in, 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 the novelness cannot carries on with h3 and queen c2, and it's kind of a nice attacking setup. It seems. I don't know how many of you are impressed by this approach to the Slav defence, but it seems like a lot of fun, uh, doesn't it? What do you think about this this approach? To playing against the Slav defense. So without white committing to d4, preparing to castle queenside, it looks like a lot of fun has been introduced here conceptually. What do you guys think? So black's obviously committed to uh, castling kingside here already, so uh, sitting target. Um, so we saw black kind of in serious trouble just on h7 really uh, pretty soon h7 is a problem and the g-file and this is just looking horrible now after knight d1 that defends everything uh, what about black doing e5 is a question which seems to be kind of thematic I don't know if there was any chance for black to do e5 at any point um, Midnight blue. Um, I'm, I'm, Bo, I'm glad you got your ducats or whatever. So, was there a chance for black to do e5 in this game? Let's have a quick look again. This sequence here. If black had done e5, then surely we just played g5 and then we got pressure on d5. That would weaken d5 if e5. I mean, that's the problem. So, this h3 and g4 works quite well. But also, you know, d5 potentially, because it's dislodging that knight from defending d5. So this worked out all pretty well to get uh, this great attack. I might try and do, do this one day against the Slav myself. It, it looks in, interesting. So uh, then the attack was just uh, seems quite easy to play. Uh, there was there wasn't any real defence. It seems of the h6 pawn coming up interesting so okay uh, so he was back on the road winning games so in round four the pressure starts going up again like a higher rated opponent in round four 2340 by the name of Maxence Gonard so Nigel was playing black again so what happened in this game playing black we saw d4 Knight f6. Let's flip the board, in fact. Okay, and actually, in this game, I think we see a very exciting opening choice uh, the Benko Gambit. So, Nigel Short playing the Benko, Benko Gambit, a6, and the Gambit is accepted. And in this position, we see g6 which i guess is absolutely the way to play uh you shouldn't be taking it immediately perhaps um so g6 uh 
okay so knight c3 and now we see bishop takes a6 g3 and there could be a problem with, with d6 uh, soon this is now addressed with black playing d6 um, okay so bishop g2 knight bd7 okay so knight f3 bishop g7 off the castles knight b6 this looks fairly standard as well as pressure on d5 this knight could also be menaced coming to c4 and you might think why would knight b6 be good to come to c4 and maybe this is one of the mysterious secrets of playing uh, the Banco Gambit because white on the queen side has this construction here with this knight kind of potentially under fire like this so how would we undermine this knight on c3 if, if that's if that's a target that knight and what has this move got to do with this knight so this could be a little Banco Gambit secret being revealed here that actually th this pawn is the only thing holding up the knight sometimes so knight c4 let's see what resources are up the sleeve of Nigel Short here so we see rook e1 black castles knight h4 knight fd7 putting pressure on c3 immediately queen c2 and now what's this point what's the point of knight c4 okay well one point here might be that b3 could be tricky in this position to play if white plays b3 white actually played knight f3 if white played b3 perhaps queen a5 and white is deprived of the option of bishop b2 here because knight takes b2 and this c3 knight is attacked so that would be quite nasty the routine b3 is all of a sudden looking unattractive here Uh, what do you think so okay so we see uh, in this position knight f3 so it looks as though b3 has been discouraged queen a5 really stopping b3 now because that's c3 knight knight d2 and now another point is revealed about this knight does it just go back what would you play here now if you're on play chess please could you um, hide your notation tab uh, to play these guess the move quizzes so what does black play here if I give you 20 seconds starting from now Anyone? Any ideas? <clears throat> Black to play. Okay. Okay, the clue is it's not knight b6. No, nope, it's knight a3. Just, you know, I'm trying to undermine this c3. Knight a3. And obviously that's attacking the queen, which is useful. Okay, so we see queen d1. So really, look at white's queen side. This is very unfortunate now. That white's queen side is being really scrutinized heavily by all of these pieces this queen side is really under intense pressure knight b3 would seem to be rel relieving something but the queen just goes all the way back here to d8 ready perhaps for any bishop g5 is already protecting e7 for example uh, okay so we see queen d2 
Now the knight goes to b5, challenging c3 here. Queen c2. Now we see c4. Knight d2. And now this isn't a structure white wants. Knight takes c3. Look at this structure. Isolated pawns uh, away from each other. A2 is, is particularly a target. C3 is still a target, and the queen comes back for C3 now. So C3 again is, is a target. An awkward looking move, knight b1 to defend C3. Knight c5 now seems to threaten things like knight b3 because we've got this pin on the rook. So white plays a4. It doesn't look correct, any of this now. White's play, it looks as though white has been stuffed on the queen side quite badly so far. And this next move basically starts to win material back by force. Where's the A-pawn going? Uh, so the A-pawn is taken. Okay, there's a pin. Is that a problem here? Not really. Rook B3. Eliminating the pieces behind that pressure of the pin on A4. Useful. Uh, potentially. So bishop e3, rook takes a3, queen takes, and that b3 square is pretty neat now, knight b3. Now black's threatening bishop takes c3 potentially. Queen b2 defending c3. Look at white's passive position. This is a good advert, it would seem, for the Benko Gambit. And his opponent here is 2340 and has this position. It's, it looks pretty horrible. So bishop d7, white, you know, this a file looks beautiful. Or even a1 is a useful resource to go to a1. Okay, attacking e7 here. Um, that's not seen as a big deal. Queen a1. Queen's come off. Now black's threatening, say bishop takes c3 because of this pin, among other things. The rook defends itself. So this isn't a threat. Okay, now is e7 going to be done something about? Yes, f6, temporarily blocking in the bishop. It's, it's not the major issue of the position at the moment, this bishop. Rook a2, hitting e2. That moves. And now the bishop comes back again into the game with f5. Looking at c3. Bishop g5, looking at e7. The king can come in to defend e7. So again, black looks great here. Look at this stranded knight. You know, this is beautiful, stopping the knight from developing. This pressure on the seventh is good. This pressure here is good. We see bishop h3. Knight c5. Uh, so e4, is that going to drop? e takes f5. g takes. We see knight d2 now. Is there a problem here with c4? Well, the king now comes to attack this bishop. So what on earth is this about? Well, the thing is, if bishop takes e7, then of course rook takes d2. Okay, so that bishop cannot take there. Bishop e3 goes back. And now a really nasty tactical move in this position, a really nasty forcing move. After all that beautiful positional play, we see this really nasty forcing move in this position. Can you see what black plays here? If I give you 20 seconds starting from now. Okay. F F four F four. So, hitting two bishops at once. Uh, so if bishop takes f four, we just take this one. If this one's taken, then taking here attacks the knight as well. So this is winning a piece basically. This is winning a piece, um, isn't it? Because actually this this is also attacked by the knight. So we've got two pieces attacked. But there's a but here. There's a check to get out of that. 
was this a miscalculation key h6 well actually this can't be taken yet because that that knight's also attacked from the rook so maybe not so the knight moves now and we see e2 and of course now it seems bishop c3 is a big concern rook b1 knight d3 this rook can't really go anywhere without laying e1 now we see bishop b5 and here with this move actually white resigned in this position so why would white resign here why, why do you think uh, white resigned if I give you 20 seconds and I'll try and establish exactly why as well so if it's not obvious so white resigned with bishop b5 Anyone? Well, I think, yeah, I think the forcing move rook b2 comes to mind here. Because uh, if we look at rook b2, black would be forced to take on b2. And here it seems c3 is dropping. There's no way of stopping the pawn. This bishop's being locked out of e2, and black is still threatening bishop c3. And there doesn't seem to be the fence against that. So I think we've just witnessed the magnificent Benko Gambit example. All that pressure on the queen side. Let's just rewind this game. So um, how, how did this happen again? So uh, knight b6. Uh, we saw knight c4. And I don't know, white was wasting time with his knight h4 and then back. I, don't, I think white was really indecisive here for what was uh, the issues on the queen side. And all of a sudden, the queen side's coming under real fire. Knight a3 is a nifty resource. And uh, this, this is blocking in the own, own bishop. So what was actually the threat here for queen d2 uh, to be an issue? Why would queen d2 be played in this position? Does anyone know? Why, let's try and guess. Why, why would white, who's 2340, decide on queen d2? Anyone? Any clues? To protect C3 is mentioned on stream. Defels to protect C3. Is Bishop takes C3 an actual threat here? Let's just take care. Is that a threat? Not really convinced. Well, I think though one thing though, if the bishop moves, you know, again, knight c4 is going to be on b2. So I think queen d2 is just, well, possibly, just just to say to the knight to, to go away. It, it, okay, to, to protect c3, to threaten the knight to get that to go away. Okay, it's a bit annoying. So possibly, yes. Um, not, not that black was threatening bishop c3, but just to evict the knight. Okay, so we see knight b5. Uh, and then the queen goes back, so it's it's more reasonably placed. It's not blocking bishop now anyway. But um, so we see this this structural change c4, okay, and and this this is just a horrible structural change though, because these pawns uh, look quite vulnerable, especially the a pawn. So th this this started to be quite horrible for white. Uh, once he lost that a pawn, black was getting all all he wanted from the opening, uh, not even any material down, and um, 
a lot of pressure uh, and now a tactical idea just to win material uh, or get this menacing pawn rather on e2 and that was uh, so a nice little finish would be rook b2 for example but white resign with bishop b5 okay pretty good stuff so let's go on to another game um, Ah, oh, there's a bit of an involved 161 moves. Uh, there's, a, there's another one which is 63 moves. And there's a shorter one, though, in round seven, which is 36 moves. So in my current state, let's go for the 36 move one in round seven. So Nigel had been winning game after game after that round two. And I think he's just beaten a 2700 in round eight. So from losing in round two, believe it or not, he's won seven out of seven. Well, he's only lost one game in round two, and he's won all the other games. I think he won today against the Quen. Um, so this is it in round seven. Let's try and get this PGN in again. So in round seven, So he was up against the 2497. So the ratings started going higher again after he's like winning, winning, and winning. So in round seven, so he plays e4. Let's flip the board. And we get a, a normal Roy Lopez, nothing uh, too fancy, or do we? In fact, black uh, plays this kind of surprise move. It's not supposed to have such a great uh, reputation, knight d4. White just takes that and castles. C6, bishop goes to a4. Knight f6, that's protected. D6. White's not in a rush to play c3 here. He fixes first that d4 pawn. Sometimes white might be interested in c3 later. This looks a little bit on the awkward side, actually, this next move, bishop g4. It's like, does the queen really want to go there? No, he's up to f3. Okay. Is f3 desirable to play f3? And is c3 desirable even to try and undermine this? No, actually c4, just giving black the option, you know, he can keep that pawn there. Um, and black does, does keep the pawn there, so it's an interesting position, strategically. g6. f4 and the bishop goes back queen goes to d2 now bishop c8 bishop goes back strange game <laughs> so um it's closed position you know tempo doesn't matter it doesn't matter that much b4 and d4 looks like a target though to bishop b2 coming up bishop g7 A lot of pawn moves by white. I don't know what you guys think of this position after h3. Do you think uh, white has played too many pawn moves here? Uh, this one. Would you say too many pawn moves? Does it look like a um, strange or reasonable in the circumstance? Out of interest. For example, I mean, does g3 stand out as a weakness from h3 here? Is black in any position to exploit dark squares? Well, let's see what happens anyway. So, so knight d7. And the bishop comes back to d1. Okay. Queen b6. Then we see knight a3. As though there's an interest in knight c2, which protects b4 and attacks maybe soon gangs up on d4 but there's another point of knight a3 that maybe c5 and knight c4 would gain interesting uh, time on the queen interesting sac sacrifice okay um white castled sorry black castled rook b1 and you know is b5 a threat was back just going to react with c5 black wasn't bothered just played f5 
e takes f5 g takes isn't this bishop going to be hemmed in by its own pawn in this position we do see an interesting pawn sacrifice it seems we see c5 what on earth does c5 do it does give the knight this c4 square so dc bc Now, if queen takes c5 is played, actually, knight c4 isn't just pretty. It's actually threatening bishop a3, if we look at this position. Knight c4 here actually threatens bishop a3. So isn't this quite nasty for black? Black actually didn't like the look of that and went back with his queen to d8. And now we see queen b4 protecting c5 and maybe can use this diagonal as well, potentially b6 that's taken a takes bishop f3 there's targets now in black's position white seems to have a lot of pressure look at what is pressure this bishop's hemmed in by this one this bishop's hemmed in by this one bishop b7 the knight's got that juicy c4 square b6 is under scrutiny king h8 but what about the a2 pawn you're asking there's other issues here though it's not just about b6 there's knight d6 on that bishop a6 now c6 is dropping whoops and now a really nasty tactical move here from white in this position not that black seems to have an the only counterplay black has is this attack on d3 right now what does white play here if I give you 20 seconds starting from now? <clears throat> yeah, okay, well done, uh, Valky44. And Alex Kidd, yeah. Rookie eight. Whoa, look at this. Try to get the rook off. F seven. Okay, the queen moves to C seven. Rook takes B eight. Knight takes B eight. This one threat is parried now with Bishop B five. Might seems to be almost a uh, solid pawn up all of a sudden. So Bishop takes B five, Knight takes B five. Queen f7. Want the exchange of queens? Queen g6? Nope. Bishop a3. Attacking the rook. The rook moves. Oh, is there some attack on g2 here to be worried about? Not really. Queen d5. Defend g2 from here. Bishop f6. Bishop d6 coming around like this for bishop e5. That means d4 is fall falling off soon queen g3 is it really attacking d3 here forcing move time bishop takes b8 whoa hang on a sec it looks as though that uh, rook takes b8 if rook takes b8 it looks as though queen d6 is pretty nasty how does how would black defend that so in this position actually black tried to queen takes d3 and a forcing move again rook b3 and here actually black resigned um you might think well isn't there any checks not really i suppose check here just king h2 there's nothing it seems it's good to say it seems in the engine era we're in because engines can find all sorts of resources from positions. So I'll say it seems that there's nothing against Queen D6 here. Black resigned. Uh, so um, let's have a look at that game again. It seems a bit crazy, the opening. It's a very rare bird choice from Black to play Knight D4 here. So what was the problem with this Knight D4 system? 
let's see again so knight takes d4 you might think well the double pawns this pawn is potentially vulnerable instead of going for c3 you know d3 c3 there's this interesting concept here that the pawn was kind of allowed to be there without offering it c3 when white played c4 white was kind of surrounding this pawn wasn't he if we look at this sequence what we saw was the option given to black with c4 uh, to leave that pawn there black now let's imagine black had taken on c3 with en passant where would white's pressure be maybe would white be interested in taking with the knight i assume with the knight that would look quite pretty i suppose uh, we've got this semi open c file to look forward to i think that's that's a nice position so maybe i know black thought it was best to leave the pawn um there and we see it kind of being um surrounded soon because of b4 trying to get rid of discourage c5 because then you get this like b file now this h3 if if white hadn't done h3 then i think as someone mentioned um so, say white had done knight a3 here well knight g4 threatens actually to use that pawn doesn't it and then we've got this diagonal so that h3 actually makes a lot of sense it does seem that that's a nasty thing to get into e3 here so this move h3 seems quite quite um necessary the threat is actually knight g4 from this bishop retreat to get into e3 so h3 no <laughs> sorry it wasn't it wasn't played here knight g4 um because probably bishop b2 in this position or e5 it's the king's still in the center uh but it might be on the cards now so it was stopped yes thank you uh, midnight blue for mentioning that yeah so knight g4 yeah okay and this bishop going back uh means it can can use this this diagonal if black ever plays c5 he's weakening light squares anyway so this bishop's more effective here this pawn is is getting uh to feel some pressure potentially now f5 probably doesn't look like a good move in retrospect but where is black's actual counterplay here because if white's given ch the chance you know maybe knight c2 bishop b2 queen f2 even and where does d4 go if we imagine this bishop on f3 and black playing c5 then these light squares are also good as well on this diagonal so i don't know there's a bit of a problem with this d4 pawn E takes G takes and we see C5 so tactical forcing move helping white's position uh, so really kind of dislocating this pawn away from the other pawns okay so Queen B4 okay that's taken and we saw uh, in this position okay and there was this option of rook takes a2 i don't think that was palatable because actually we've got a tactical forcing move here haven't we knight d6 hits the bishop and threatens queen b3 check that's that's not possible to take here surely so um king h8 got out of the way on that diagonal and uh now black is losing that c6 it seems you might think well hold on a sec uh what about in this position c5 here attacking the queen i think white just takes here and he's attacking the queen here doesn't help okay so uh that bishop moved out of the way losing c6 nice tactic there and white seems to consolidate quite nicely uh, with the help of quite a few important forcing moves as well so Bishop d6 um, not only just about Bishop e5 but first thing to take here 
on b8 in some circumstances. For example, this circumstance, queen g3, just taking on b8, just winning material. Uh, okay, so um, um, do, does anyone want to see um, one more game, or should we leave it for next week? Um, I don't know if anyone's uh, keen to see one more game. What do you reckon? Or we could leave it till next week if you want. Uh, Uh, there's quite a few of you here on the places on Twitch, so okay. Um, this okay. So there's two game choices. Um, one is 63 moves against a 2518 Art Arta Jakubovic. The other is 61 moves against the 2453. Um, one was a Sicilian defense, which is quite interesting. I think for me the Sicilian defense is quite an attractive game to have a look at. Uh, actually, let's have a look at the Sicilian defense game. So this was in round six. So Nigel Schwartz was playing Arta Jacobi Jacobic two five one eight e4 we see the Sicilian defense knight f3 knight c6 white plays knight c3 e6 d4 c takes knight takes queen c7 bishop e3 knight f6 it's all pretty standard Opening fairing, I suspect. So a6, queen d2, bishop b4, white castles queen side. Okay, knight e5. Uh, so, what do you think about this opening? So, black might be interested in trying to get the light square bishop here or just damage the pawn structure potentially uh, so knight b3 actually that c4 square is celebrated a little bit more with b5 queen e1 and now um, does black really want to give up the dark square bishop he's going to be he's got dark square weaknesses he doesn't really want to take on c3 surely even if it doubles the pawns this bishop actually retreated back to e7. Uh, I don't know how many of you will be interested in doubling the pawns. I don't think that's a very dynamic choice. Uh, that's an interesting question maybe to pose. Would, would you be interested in doubling white's pawns here? Uh, yes or no, if I gave you 20 seconds to vote. So starting from now. I don't know that Karpov would do it actually because in this position black has dark square weaknesses if we went with bishop c3 okay queen let's go with queen c3 L look at the dark square weaknesses we've got bishop c bishop c5 coming up surely it's too important as midnight blue says and we've also got the horrible move knight a5 in this position to stop bishop b7 as well okay so that wasn't chosen the bishop just went back you know the queen is actually guarding a5 here to knight a5 we see king b1 d6 bishop d4 black castles f4 knight c6 Bishop drops back to f2. Bishop b7. 
bishop d3 rook a c8 uh, it looks as though c2 is reinforced at the moment with this bishop and e5 might be dangerous at some point potentially queen e2 for the moment black's got a good lock on the e5 square here okay we see knight b4 as though maybe you know d5 is on the cards potentially or just knight takes d3 first then d5 and in fact that's black's goal here to get rid of this potentially dangerous light square bishop it seems after a3 he did take the bishop well a3 prompts taking the bishop anyway c takes d3 as though white's interested in well strengthening e4 maybe using the c file we see e5 stopping e5 from white fixing this e4 pawn rook c1 so white's cheekily sharing that c file which is supposed to be black c file so what is all this and white's got a stronger center than usual does it look all brilliant for white what is done queen d7 we see g3 protecting that pawn because the queen had to move obviously because of knight d5 looks pretty pretty dangerous so the queen moved and then that pawn was protected rook f e8 rook hd1 curiously the bishop drops back to a8 Uh, so what does this mean bishop a8 let's see but white actually took on e5 here d takes knight a2 as though this this is this is potentially useful knight b4 so maybe attack a6 queen e6 attacking this knight that moves to c5 here which seems to be in white's favor to pick up the dark square bishop after what we've just said as well black actually takes this and we see rook takes rook takes bishop takes and now h6 look at this structure over here it looks as though queen h3 could be useful in the future oh it seems oh I don't know what I've done with my laptop but I'm getting to be out of power I've only got seven minutes <laughs> my laptop's out of power sorry I don't know what happened there oh, I messed this up um, whoops okay we'll try and finish up before I lose power uh, rook c1 rook d8 um, Rook c3, a5. Uh, that's that's really unfortunate. Uh, just take you through. Uh, just just swiftly go go through a bit now because I've only got like five minutes before everything's turning off. B4. Uh, okay, targeting d3. A b a b. Queen c2. This was the wrong game to, to pick on. <laughs> Knight b8, rook c5. Okay, king h7, rook a5, f6, rook c5, rook d 